Joe, you're very welcome to the Skillex Insider Podcast. Delighted and thrilled to have you on the show today. Yeah, great to be here, Brendan. I'm happy to be here. Brilliant. Well, look, delighted to have you on. Uh, you know, our vision is to inspire, connect, and enable millions of ambitious leaders of small to medium-sized enterprises to scale with purpose. So I open the show with this question to all of our guests, Joe. What does scaling with purpose mean to you? You know, here's what's really funny. I I could uh, I, I could give you a definition and stuff, but I and I didn't tell you this beforehand. Uh, I'd love to hear your definition of scaling first. And I want to, yeah, because for one, I think even though you wrote a whole book about it, and I'm sure your listeners are very familiar with it, I think it's it, it's an interesting term that often gets interpreted in different ways. And here I am sitting in uh, Tempe, Arizona at my office headquarters right now. Uh, and I, I wanted to ask you, what, what does scaling actually mean from your perspective? And then I'll give you my spin on that. Oh, that's brilliant. No, no guest has ever turned that question around on me. So this is a first. Uh, look, there's a, there's a tactical definition, Joe, which is average annualized growth of 20% year on year over a three year period of, uh, of, of 20% measured by either growth in revenue or, or employee numbers. So that's the technical OECD definition. Essentially, it's just less than a doubling in size in a three year period. What we're really after here is where our, where our listeners and those, those business leaders and founders have, have created a wonderful product and service. Mm-hmm. I feel that they're obligated to bring that to the world. So yeah. scaling is a deliberate intention by them to actually reach as many customers as they possibly can and ultimately expand and grow themselves as a result of doing it, expand mm-hmm. and grow and challenge their teams as a result of doing it, expand, grow, scale their organizations their communities benefit, their society, the society benefits, um, and, and, and ultimately the, the clients and customers they serve benefit because if they decide that, you know, they're not going to take their product or service beyond the UK. And typically it's a mindset challenge because Mm -hmm. they've decided that they can't, whether that's explicit or, or unconscious, but it means then that clients who could avail of this wonderful product or service in the US, let's say, can't because the leader has decided that they, they're they not going to scale. So, right, right. Okay, so so my response is, so how, how can people scale? What could they do? What should they do? Here's the way that I look at it. This, I give a diff, different uh, perspective on growing and building a business at 55 years old, which as I, I am today versus when I first started my business, which was in my early 20s. And I had become a millionaire before the age of 30. Uh, when that was actually a lot of money back then. And uh, my thoughts on it are you never win a race you don't want to be in, which is a line from my my buddy uh, Nick Peterson. And some games in life, the only way you win is you don't play. So to the listeners and the people that are watching this that are out there, assuming you are involved in something that you're engaged with, and this is different than follow your passion, because I think follow your passion, frankly, is a bunch of nonsense. Uh, Mike Rowe, uh, you know, he's the guy in America that has a TV show he's done called Dirty Jobs, and he's, you know, he, he's a he's a he's a big champion for service businesses and for people that do hard work. He always talks about bringing your passion with you. Don't try to follow your passion. Bring the passion with you wherever you go. So like you said, part of it is just business strategy and tactics and methodologies. And, you know, when it comes to money, the real business everyone's in is the arithmetic business. So, you know, you can be in the plumbing business or the AI business or the VR business or the banking business or the whatever business, but you're really in the arithmetic business. So you got to be able to make the math work, uh, you know, what a business is is solving problems for a profit. And if you know how to solve problems, but you're, you care about those problems, you're serve, you know, it is a mindset. Uh, you have, to, in order to scale a business, you actually have to scale the entrepreneur. You have to scale the capabilities. You can't build a million dollar a year business or a $10 million a year business or a hundred million dollar a year business with $50,000 a year habits. Or, you know, should I say 100,000 pounds or what, what language should I say here? Because I speak in dollars, right? So, but what wherever you're at, 
it's whatever your opportunities are to scale, you have to make sure that your capabilities are equal to your opportunities, because if not, you're not going to reach them, no matter how much positive thinking you have, uh, you know, because, you know, the world's best positive mental attitude is no different than the worst one when it comes to making money. I know a lot of miserable people that have made a lot of money, but I also know a lot of very happy people that have not been able to. And I think the ultimate place is to actually enjoy your life, have a freaking real mission you wake up and excited about and you're you're doing things that i call that are elf easy lucrative and fun versus hard annoying lame and frustrating so i think one of the best ways to scale a business is to surround yourself with elf people get rid of as much half hard annoying lame and frustrating because you can have a hard annoying lucrative and frustrating business but not all money is created equal so one of the best ways is say for one have something that you're trying to do that is bigger than you, that is challenging. Because if there's, an, you know, there's juice and enthusiasm yeah. behind big goals. And most of the time, people that scale businesses, they have a vision of creating something that is bigger than their current capabilities are, and they grow into it. They build, they, you know, they lay the tracks as they're moving towards it. But yeah. you got to have a plan in the path. You got to understand the concept of who, not how, which is a book written by, you know, my friend Ben Hardy and Dan Sullivan. They originally got the concept from Dean Jackson, who is the guy I've been doing a podcast with, you know, uh, since 2010, the Out of Marketing podcast. And it's, you got to find the right who's because uh, where you won't scale a business is if you try to do everything yourself. In this is coming from a guy who doesn't consider himself a good manager. Uh, I'm a good leader of certain types of people, uh, but I'm a terrible leader of the wrong type of people, meaning uh, it's really hard for me to lead people that don't have a certain level of drive and intrinsic motivation because I spent half my life helping entrepreneurs build and grow their companies and also spend the other half of my life helping people with addiction recovery, uh, which makes me no money. Uh, but it's important to me because I believe it's one of the greatest human problems and the cause of so much suffering. And there's a lot of entrepreneurs that are workaholics. And so my goal is to try to help connect people. So my whole thing that I'm trying to scale is connection. Like, how do you scale connection? Not only for profit, but for, you know, people to just, you know, help humanity. Uh, and, and I'm not saying this like I'm some angel philanthropic person. It's that That's not... You know, that's not the, the, the point behind it. The point is it it actually everything that I do uh, fulfills me at a certain level. So there's a lot of, uh, you know, self-interest involved, uh, even with the stuff I do with addiction recovery. So to scale it, you got to put the people in place. You got to have the mindset in place. You certainly got to have the strategies. You got to have the right guidance, the right mentorship, the right information. Uh, and you just you make it happen. And, and I'll tell you, this is the flip side. Uh, I gave a talk to about, I don't know how many, a few hundred young entrepreneurs. And I made this comment uh, that if I would have known being successful was this much work, I would have stuck with being a loser. Uh, <laughs> you know, I mean, you're going to, you're going to, you're going to bleed. You're going to have, you're going to have pain. And in order to create an elf business, it often doesn't start off elf. You yeah. usually have to set up a lot of things in order to get to elf unless you're one of those lucky people and th that does happen where you just happen to land into everything you know what you do just matches your talents you know right timing right everything but that's usually not how life works if that does happen for you and you've not been betrayed and stolen from and abused and have your heart broken uh you know it's not a matter of 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 if it's just a matter of when, and, and I'm not saying that to try to project like, oh my God, I'm just saying you gotta, you know, there's amateurs and there's pros and, and amateurs yeah. wait for, uh, you know, amateurs wait for inspiration, professionals do it with a headache. So in order to scale, you got to turn pro and you got to become a pro. And if you don't have that right now, that's why you listen to podcasts. That's why you listen to books. That's why you seek out people that have been there, done that. I mean, there's a ton of your friends and I say this, your, I mean, me, like we all have friends and people in our lives that love to give opinions about how to do something, but you got to ask yourself the question, have they ever done what you're trying to do? And oftentimes if they haven't find someone that has, or at least has done something similar and don't be closed minded, even though even the most closed minded people think they're open minded. So I have to say all this with a grain of salt. You, you, you have to be aware 
that there's a ton of shit that we don't know that we don't know. There's stuff we don't know we, we that we know, but there's a lot of stuff we don't even know what we don't know. And so seek out people and guidance and start with a beginner's mind and approach things and say, what am I not seeing here? What could really undermine it? And, and if you're aware of the landmines and you're strategic and you're ethical and you're, you know, you, you have ambition and you are really attached to something that you're selling a product, a service, an experience that really does help humanity, scale the hell out of it. But people that are trying to scale bullshit or people that are trying to scale things that, you know, isn't like the title of my book, what's in it for them. There's a lot of people that they don't care about what's in it for them. Like like people that don't like my message in my book are usually narcissists, uh, sociopaths, psychopaths, takers. You know, what I talk about does not resonate with those people. So uh, but if you're a giver and you really create value in the world, I mean, yeah, go for it. I mean, you're, 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 it's going to be, it's going to, it's going to be difficult at times, but the rewards are exponentially greater uh, if you're really on a uh, path attached to, uh, you know, a group of people you want to be a hero to, things that you know is creating value in other people's lives. And value is an interesting word, but it just means that, you know, value is not your opinion. Value is 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 what the client or the, uh, or the customer or the patient uh, is experiencing as a result of buying what it is you give. Said another way, what humans want is more woo and less ah. And so what if you're creating is woo for your employees, for your team, for your community, for your clients, Woo, every time they do business with you, great. Uh, and if it's creating woo for you, that's awesome. And hire people that are woo and, and get rid of the people that are ah, get rid of the activities that are ah. And I say that knowing that there's going to be a lot of ah that comes along with it. Like I get into a cold plunge almost every day. And when I step into a cold plunge in the beginning, it's like ah, but the woo that comes out of it is worth doing it. So there's certain like working out. I'm, I don't like working out, but I work out almost every day. Because the consequences of working out are far greater than the consequences of not working out. So I'm willing to accept certain pains for certain results. So anyway, that's a bunch of thoughts. <laughs> here, here. There's another 20 podcasts in that, Joe. We could go so many directions, but you've you've already mentioned that your wonderful book, What's in it for them? Now, before I get into that, and what I would say, what I would just add to that to, to sum all of that up, what I certainly assert is that if you're in business. There's only one certainty and it's going to be challenging. So create a vision that, that is of your making, that seeks to help as many people as you possibly can in terms of bringing value to those people. And at least then the challenges that you have to overcome are actually challenges which add value. So uh, we're absolutely aligned. Look, you have, before we get into the book, because I'd love to do a little masterclass on it today, you've, 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 you've taken me in all, my head's spinning, you've taken me in all sorts of directions. Um, you have such a rich and, and colorful background. It's, it's really incredible. And there's been a movie made on it. So I'm going to ask you the impossible here, really, and share with the listeners who are maybe not aware of your work to give uh, the kind of the, the abridged version of your scaling story, how, how uh, you actually scaled one of the most premier networks on the planet. Yeah, no, thank you. Yeah, well, look, look, I'll try to sound a little egotistical here and just brag about how great my stuff is. However, <laughs> I, no, I'll, I'll refrain myself from doing that. The, the, the fact is most of what I've built did not initially come out of um, out of pleasure and pursuit and enthusiasm. It came out of desperation and pain and angst. And I, you know, fortunately directed a lot of that uh, throughout the years. A lot of the uh, early stages of my business were very difficult. I did make money, but I was uh, an addict, uh, first a drug addict, uh, then, you know, sexual addiction, which is really a connection disorder, an intimacy disorder, because I was uh, sexually and physically abused, uh, you know, quite a bit as a child and uh, had a lot of abandonment and stuff. So going into business really became like a function of just, you know, trying to save myself uh, from being um, enslaved by, uh, you know, the desires of other people. And so it's, you know, it's it, 
in terms of the lessons that I could share with people, I'm not saying any of this in a way to evoke any sort of poor me sort of stuff. Uh, we trauma does create a lot of people's issues. Uh, and, and, and certainly that's where addiction comes from. It's a response to trauma and it's also, you know, biochemical lack of dopamine and, 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 and things where your system's not working right. And so everything we do from pursuing businesses to going snow skiing to, uh, you know, doing yoga to singing, to dancing, to doing art. I mean, there's all forms of expression. And I think business is another form of expression. When I was in high school, the only thing that allowed my brain to escape uh, other than doing drugs was throwing pottery on a potter's wheel. And it, it was interesting because I, uh, I I can't read my own handwriting hardly. I mean, I can read it, but it's not very good. And I don't know how to paint and I don't have any other artistic skills. I never, uh, my liking of sports were ruined by a sadistic little league coach uh, playing baseball as a kid. So I never got into sports. Uh, I became a drug addict in high school. Uh, and I was in a lot of pain and I through business books and through things like, you know, Earl Nightingale's, uh, you know, it's funny because his his uh, wife, Diana, uh, was just here at my Genius Network meeting, you know, two weeks ago. Oh, wow. And I, you know, and I'm, I'm putting a, together a bunch of stuff to release Earl Nightingale stuff out into the world that no one's ever heard before. Wow. And, uh, you know, I, I would listen to, you know, these tapes from people like Brian Tracy, who's now a dear friend of mine, or Tony Robbins, who I know very well, you know, and all these things early on. And it was through books and through entrepreneurship that gave me some semblance of meaning because I didn't have, you know, my mentors early on were books and audio programs when they were on cassette tape. <laughs> and so, um, you know, my journey became, I was, a, I started off as a uh, carpet cleaner. I mean, I had, a, I had jobs. I went, when I was in a, uh, you know, when I was in college, I really went to, I went to a, a place called, uh, you know, Las Cruces, New Mexico. And I went to college at New Mexico State University, really to get sober from being a drug addict, just to get away from the environment I was in. And I ended up getting a job at a health club and I was selling gym memberships. And then I met a person there after about a year of working there and becoming a really great salesperson uh, selling gym memberships, I ended up getting offered a job at a mental health uh, facility where I would drive some of the people that were there for treatments to AA meetings, Alcoholics Anonymous, NA, Narcotics Anonymous, CA, Cocaine's Anonymous meetings. And I would sit in those meetings, uh, not realizing what an impact that would have. And then when I came back to Arizona, I started a carpet cleaning business because a friend talked me into it. And uh, I struggled. I lived off credit cards. I went deeply into credit card debt and I was ready to get out of that business. And uh, I was trying to do something else. And I thought there was something wrong with the business that I was in. And I went on a jet ski trip because oh, a friend from high school called me up one uh, Saturday. Well, he called me on Friday and he said, hey, you want to go jet skiing with me tomorrow and a couple of friends? And I was like, no, nah, you know, and I was broke. I was literally living off credit cards, doing hard manual labor and I was paying money to go broke. I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I didn't want to work for anyone. And, uh, you know, and, and there's many ways that you can go broke. And back then there was no internet. So, you know, if you want to go broke, it's way more intelligent to sit on a, you know, a sofa and watch TV and go broke that way versus going out and cleaning carpets for 10, 12 hours a day, sweating your ass off and paying money to do that. But that's where I was at. Because damn it, I had this little entrepreneurial <laughs> fire inside of me that, that I wanted to succeed. And so my friend, he's like, going, you want to go jet skiing? I know I got so much work to do because I, I really didn't have any money. And he goes, well, you know, the guy that owns the jet skis, he's this multi-million dollar real estate investor. And as soon as he said that, I was like, oh, you know, there's some some rich guy. Maybe I could go get some advice from this guy. So I, you know, lugged my way up in this piece of crap pickup truck that I had up to a lake in Arizona called Segura Lake. And there was my friend Pat I went to high school with and this uh, this rich guy, I don't remember his name, and this rich guy had a friend. And we're sitting, on, I finally had a chance to sit on the tailgate of this guy's pickup truck which hit with him because there was only two jet skis. And so when my friend and his this rich guy's friend went on the jet skis, I sat with this guy and I said, hey, I, you know, I hear you do really well in business and I wanted to, you know, ask your advice because I, you know, have a small carpet cleaning business, but I want to get out of this business and go into another industry because it's it's just really challenging. And he said to me, and, and the reason I'm sharing you this story, because it, it, it literally planted the seed on what became everything after that. 
and he's it, it, this was the most important conversation I had ever had with any sort of mentor uh, at any point in my life. And it wasn't what he said was so profound. It was I was ready to hear it. And what you know, that whole when the students ready, the yeah. teacher appears sort of thing. I mean, like, literally, this is what kind of happened to me. And so I'm sitting there on this, you know, this pickup truck and, you know, the middle of summer and it's hot as hell in Arizona and, and, and uh, tailgate of this guy's, you know, truck. And I, I said, uh, you know, I was telling him about my carpet cleaning business. And he said to me, he goes, well, are there other people in your industry that are doing well? And I said, yeah, there's a, you know, there's a couple of companies in Phoenix that make over a million a year. And to me, that's a lot of money. And, uh, you know, they've been around for a while though, and they're established and I'm relatively new and I'm, you know, and he, and, and I'm, and he said, well, he goes, if there's other people that are doing well in your business and you're not, there's nothing wrong with the business you're in. There's something wrong with you. And I said, well, no, 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 no. I, I said, uh, you know, I've been trained, I'm certified, I'm ethical. I don't do bait and switch advertising like a lot of these companies do. They advertise a low price and then they high price. I go and do any of that. I take care of my clients. I know what I'm doing, but it's just a really tough business. And I was just making excuses, making excuses. And he said, he goes, young man, you're like most people. You think the grass is always greener on the other side. He said, well, and I'd already told him I'd gotten trained and certified and I'd spent, you know, a long time doing that. He said, if you're going to go into another industry, hoping that you're going to be successful. You're going to spend another six months, another year, another two years learning the technical skills of another business. So you can go out and repeat the same bad business habits that have caused you to be failing at this one. That's what he said to me. And I'm sitting there going, you know, shit, this is not the motivational talk I was looking for. <laughs> um, but he said, he goes, what you need to do, young man, is you need to learn fundamental business skills. You need to learn how to make a business work. Because if you can do that, you can go into any industry that you want. You just need, so he didn't give me any answers to my, my, my business problem, which at the time was I didn't understand marketing. I didn't understand how to sell what it is that I was selling. But what he did do was he caught, for whatever reason, just that the way everything just played out, I, I, I drove home that night and I was really sunburnt from being out all day in the sun. And, 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 and I had this thought in my head saying, I live in America. I think this is a great country. I have a lot of personal problems. Uh, I have a lot of challenges. You know, I was, you know, just recently, you know, just had gotten sober from being a drug addict and I had started exercising, which I'd never really done before. And I was sitting there thinking, you know, I got a brain. I'm a hard worker. I got good ethics. There's other people that don't seem to be anywhere near as driven or as hardworking or as even ethical as I feel I am. And uh, they're doing much better than me. They know something that I don't know. So what the hell do I need to learn? And so I made a, uh, I made a uh, commitment to myself that I would not get out of that business until I figured out how to make it work and I would make it profitable. And so with that decision, I made a commitment. And a lot of people don't make commitments. They jump from thing to thing, the thing, the thing. And that's the problem with chasing passion is with chasing passion, like my, you know, uh, friend, friend Cal Newport, you know, he wrote one of his very first books was uh, so good. They can't ignore you, which is, you know, you, uh, when you're ch chasing passion, you're trying to figure out what sort of value can the world bring to you. But when you develop skills, it's what value can you bring to the world? So, you know, you want to develop skills that are rare and valuable and you want to put them into place, into a business long enough, even if you have a job, long enough to where you get career capital is what Cal Newport calls it. And then when you have career capital, then you have control over your life. And I had not yet had control over my business because I didn't know what to do. Once you get a certain element of a, of a plan and a path that works, then you can take it as far as you, your current capabilities or the capabilities you hire or that you partner with. And that's how you scale something. And so for, for, yeah, so that's what happened to me. And then that ended up becoming, uh, I'll, I'll stop there. I can go on and talk about genius network and where that started, but I'll tell you, that was when I was a dead broke carpet cleaner. And, you know, with that sort of insight, I then developed all kinds of marketing methodologies that helped turn my carpet cleaning business around. I learned how to make that business work. And then ultimately I started teaching that to other carpet and upholstery cleaners and uh, built the largest training organization in the nineties in the world for professional carpet and upholstery cleaners and people that are in fire and flood restoration and ran that business for many years. We still have a lot of clients in that business. I still own that company, but I just haven't put a lot of emphasis on it in a long time. But, you know, throughout you know, for over 20 years, 
we had over 12,000 cleaning and restoration companies all over the world. I probably had 200 people in uh, UK and Ireland and all kinds of different members and uh, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, Russia, Spain. I mean, you name it. And uh, the stuff worked and uh, and it still does. And so we, 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 you know, transformed thousands of service businesses and, you know, license it to all kinds of other industries, all kinds of cool stuff. And how did you move from there then to Genius Network, where you now have a network of of high profile global entrepreneurs who are paying in some instances over a hundred thousand dollars just to be part of your network how do you move from training carpet cleaners to being being the most connected guy on the planet joe well, well you know it's fine there's probably people that are way more connected to me and it depends on what you're connected to but in terms of my connections i know a lot of people and i've I've worked really hard at that. And simply because I was a very disconnected person growing up, I was very shy, very introverted. Uh, I still don't like going to cocktail parties. People think I'm like some social person that loves going out and meeting new people. And frankly, it's actually quite uncomfortable. I, I mean, I'm more comfortable with people that I know than trying to go out and meet, you know, 10 new people a day. That's not that that's not me. Some people are way better at that. What I'm really good at, though, is is thinking what's in it for them. I, I've trained myself to where it's not a tactic. It is a embodiment. It is a real place of coming from being a giver. And, it, it, and, and, and I don't expect anyone to give anything for me. I don't ask anyone to do anything for me without creating value first. And, and oftentimes, that doesn't mean you go out and bleed yourself and give everything to everyone. You have to be very selective. You know, Dale Carnegie wrote a great book called how to win friends and influence people. And the question, and I love that book, this book, what's in it for them. I actually acknowledge that book yeah. in the beginning and say that this book wouldn't even <clears throat> exist had it not been for Dale Carnegie's book. And what I also say is that it's not just about winning the friends and influencing people. It's about winning the right friends and influencing the right people. Cause you know, Zig Ziglar uh, has this well-known line, um, which is you can get anything you want in life. If you help enough other people get what they want. <laughs> And that is true with the caveat that you can work your ass off helping other people get what they want that won't do a damn thing for you, that will take advantage of you, that will lie to you, that will abuse you if you select and give the, the, the value to the wrong people. So let's get into this. And this is where your concept of elf really comes into play, easy, lucrative and fun. And I have to share with you uh, my morning affirmation now, my morning gratitude, my future gratitude actually includes elf. So oh, that, I, I love it. Elf came in the in the cleaning industry when I, when I was. Yeah, yeah but we'll go. On. And then and then I'll actually I'll answer the uh, what how this ended up turning. In, yeah. I, so I, let we'll we'll I, we'll piece that we'll piece the the scaling story as we go on, because I want to get yeah. into the book. It's a it's a wonderful book. I'm going to I'm going to read you a line actually from from our own book, which we wrote a couple of years ago, I actually published it last year. And this is why my eyes lit up when I seen that you were publishing this book. I'll read this to you. When you're doing your partnership due diligence, so this is in relation to our um, our ninth principle from our ScaleX framework, which is documented and enshrined in the Simple Scaling book. When uh -huh. you're doing your partnership due diligence, ask what's in it for them. There has to be clarity about that on both sides. That's when you hit the sweet spot, when there is a double accentuation of your respective propositions, when the relationship is greater than the sum of its parts. So I was I was buzzing when I seen that actually you'd, you'd written an entire book on this. So you have a beautiful line on this. Uh, it's, it's in one of the opening principles. You document nine principles in the book, and I encourage everyone to, to get a copy of the book. For those listening, I'm holding up a copy of uh, Joe's book, What's In It For Them. You state that learning, uh, I'm gonna come to that one. The secret to success is creating value for others. In doing so, we must become a pain detective. Yeah. Can you share with our listeners what you mean by that, Joe? So there's a lot of ways that you can develop rapport with people. You can uh, develop rapport by being funny, by being attractive, by having something that it is they want. You can be useful and helpful in a bunch of different ways. And I think one of the most uh, uh, valuable ways to be valuable to someone is to simply identify where they hurt and make them feel better or give them an opportunity to get out of the hurt. And 
this is not to be taken out of context uh, with with like if you're a parent uh you don't want to handicap your kids by making their life too easy there are certain pains that people have to go through there are certain struggles that people want to go through you need to deal with people with the level at which they respond there's not just physical pain there's psychological pain there's financial pain there's relationship pain there's trust pains there's there's all kinds of different pains that humans encounter and what a business is like i'd said earlier solving problems for a profit and uh, others people other people's bad news is your good news which is a line uh, and uh, conversation i've had with uh, from dan sullivan the founder of strategic coach who's been one of my genius network members for over you know since 2010 and i've been in you know one of his clients since 1997 so um, other people's bad news is your good news everybody has bad news and if you think of almost any business, all the people that are reading, you know, simply scaling, uh, they, what are they scaling? They're they're actually probably scaling a business that, in some way, shape, or form, is turning other people's bad news into good news. If they're, are if they're in the transformation business, if they're in the transaction business, they could be selling shitty food, pornography, tobacco. I mean, there's all kinds of things in. You know, look, I'm a free market guy. So, I mean, I think people have choices to buy what it is they want. So I'm not going to, you know, sit and get on a moral soapbox. I, I I can only make decisions from what I think is good or bad. Uh, I've had many opportunities to go into businesses that are legal, but I don't think they're ethical. I don't think they expand people. So I choose not to, you know, I mean, if someone came, you know, from a, you know, like a, a pharmaceutical company, and said, hey, we want to pay $100 million. But, I mean, there are some pharmaceuticals that are obviously useful. And there's also pharmaceutical companies that I think are responsible for genocide right now. So it's, uh, you know, it's one of those things to where money's great, but it's like, what is it that is actually solving? So pain, I always look for, <clears throat> what is the pain that someone's in? Where do they hurt? Do I have any solution? Uh like, I'm not going to sell something that I sell to someone that doesn't need it. Why the hell would I do that? You know, I could, you know, use all the most clever, effective marketing that my brain could conjure up. However, do you, I mean, do, do you ever feel good when you've made a purchase that you don't even need or someone's, mm -hmm. you know, so I, I, I want to be in the value creation monopoly business where, where someone grants you. And, and again, that's a term from my buddy, Dan Sullivan where you don't lock someone into doing business with you because you put them into a contract they can't get out of, or you're the only, you know, electric company or cell company in town or whatever, and they're forced to do business with you, no matter how shitty the, the service is. I like it when you are really valuable and people grant you the business simply because you're awesome and they appreciate the way you do business. That's the ultimate sort of business to be in where you don't have to lock people into things. And I'm not saying you shouldn't. I mean, there are some things that people just... You know, if, if they didn't have laws with uh, insurance for car insurance, most people would probably drive around without car insurance, right? Yeah. So there, there are certain industries that require uh, cell phone stick rate where it's it's very difficult for you to like, you know, to disconnect. And I mean, how many things, you know, in the last recent years has become a subscription service? And, you know, why do they do that? Because they found it takes just as much effort to sell someone something once as it does to sell it to them over and over and over again. So that's a whole nother uh, discussion. But when it comes to pain, can you continually remove pain? Can you approach someone? And so a lot of my world is spent in things that have nothing to do with making money. And if you've ever sat with uh, a parent, like both my parents, uh, are dead. Uh, my mother died when I was four. My father died when I was in my mid thirties. I was his uh, caretaker for the last year of his life. And if you've ever sat with someone in a hospice center or someone that's dying, you know, you, 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 you there's a point where they're not going to live. There's a point where the damage is so severe, where the injury, you know, my best friend, Sean Stevenson, I was in the hospital with him in 2019 when he had an accident and he died. I mean, it was devastating. And I mean, he was, it was just painful. And I was there with his wife and a few of his friends. And it, it was something, you know, completely unexpected. And this is my best friend. And when you've sat in moments where people are, are, are just hurting, sometimes the best thing you can do is just be a companion. You know, you're, yeah. you're, you know, so when I say be a pain detective, there are certain things you can't make it better. 
you can only be there. You can, you can, sometimes it's just your presence. It's your attention. And so oftentimes being a giver doesn't mean you have to give material items or you have to give money or you have to, sometimes you just give of yourself. Sometimes it's just, you know, a smile. You know, I mean, I, the way that I look at who becomes a true friend, not a deal friend, but a real friend, um, is how are people that are more powerful treat people that are less powerful than them? You know, when you, when someone opens a door for you, do you say, thank you? When you go and uh, you're with a server and you see the person like really busy, very stressed out, oftentimes saying, Hey, you're working really hard. I really appreciate you. Thank you. I mean, it can make their day and it requires nothing other than a bit of enthusiasm and courtesy. And I am amazed how many people are oblivious to noticing the pain and the angst and the stress of other people's lives. It doesn't require you to be, you know, I say be a pain detective and I go through a whole process and what's in it for them on how to be, you know, to go deeper with people's pain and people's angst. And, you know, a lot of it is not super complicated. Others requires, you know, coming from a place of, of truly uh, developing the, compa the compassion muscle. You know, like uh, I, I'm uh, my partner, uh, but, you know, she's a surgeon. You know, I'm, I'm actually dating the top vaginal plastic surgeon in Arizona. She's actually one of the best in the world. And uh, the conversations. Lucky we have, you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it, I, I, I will say with all my female friends that I just love bringing it up because they just go like they I've I've sat through conversations that most guys would never have any idea could possibly exist. Uh, but it's like many in, in, in my partner, she's like amazing because she's super sweet, super compassionate. And, and many plastic surgeons are arrogant and uh, many, many doctors like I, I, I was interviewed on a podcast um, that has 50,000 emergency room uh, physicians, uh, doctors and nurses that listen to it. And they, I was the first person they ever interviewed about addiction and about and, and how to understand addicts. And, and, and one of my friends who actually introduced me to him is her name's Dr. Jamie Hope. She, uh, you know, she wanted me to talk to them because she loves my perspective on, on addiction. And, and I said, what happens with a lot of doctors? And I said, I'm not a, I'm not a doctor. So, I mean, I can't imagine when you're a trauma doctor in an emergency room, you're seeing the worst of people, gunshot wounds. You're seeing drunk drivers that have like killed other people. I mean, you're seeing the worst of humans in their brokenness. Some that are dying, some that are bleeding, some that have hurt themselves, some that have hurt others. And if you're around pain all the time, often you get compassion fatigue where, you know, you're seeing people hurting all the time. Sometimes you, you, you forget that these are humans. Yeah. yeah. And so, and, and, and I didn't share that trying to tell them what they, you know, I mean, I don't live in their shoes. I mean, if I was living someone else's life, I would probably respond the way that they respond. Right. Uh, what, I, what I do know though, is that uh, you can, I have done more for myself, and I've seen this work in so many ways where one of the best approaches to develop a uh, rapport uh, is to be a pain detective and to focus on where people are hurting. And, and sometimes it's like, read this book, yeah. listen to this, you know, call this person, you know, oftentimes you don't need to be a magician. You just need to be aware. It this is a, a, a really nice segue into another concept you you know, you introduced in the book, certainly it was the first time I'd come across this, this phrase, you state that learning a person, learning a person's emotional atmosphere can help you understand and connect with them much easier. What yeah. do you mean by that? Well, well, I, I first, so, uh, will give you some background. I was, uh, I don't know if you ever heard of Spartan races. I'm sure yes, they do Spartan races yeah. there. So Joe, Joe DeSena, who's the founder of Spartan races, big company, they do these insane, crazy races. Uh, he asked me to be one of the keynote speakers at their, uh, the world championships they were doing in 2019 in Lake Tahoe. And so I go there and I go to the speaker area and there's like this ESPN is doing podcast and filming like, uh, these athletes and one of the guys that was there was a guy named dr don wood who used to be a hockey player and he's now a trauma therapist and it was you know the short version of this is the guy that actually ended up winning that year had just gone through his process a few days prior where he takes people through this trauma process and so uh i was talking with him about addiction and my views that you know 
most of the way that people view addiction is wrong. They think it's drugs and alcohol and porn and sex and gambling and gaming and food and internet and, you know, and, and, and it, it is all those things are ways that people can express addiction. But I said, you know, addiction is actually a solution. It's a solution to pain. You know, any person that is drinking, drugging, or behavioral addictions, it's, it's just an attempt to, to soothe some uncomfortable angst and some uncomfortable pain. And, and so most of the world is like the war on drugs. It's like, that's the wrong war. That's like a war on addicts. The drugs are actually the solution. The, the reason they're they're doing the drugs is because they're, so, you know, that's just a symptom of a deeper thing. You know, they're trying to numb, numb their way out. And he's like, wow, I really, you know... I really love that. And he he had got then he goes back on 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 stage and he's and he says, you know, Joe Polish is the only person I've ever talked with that really understands what addiction is. He said that, and of course I felt good because he edified me, but it, there's a lot of people that that think this way. So I'm not unique in this. I have a lot of you know friends in the uh, recovery space that have this same perspective. It, so then we we started talking and he said this incredible line to me. He said, you know, uh he said if you understood the atmospheric conditions of somebody's life, it would make sense why it is they do what it is they do. And I was like, when I heard that, I was like, yep. I go, you know, if, if you understood, like I am a byproduct of the atmospheric conditions of my life, everyone listening here, you, everyone, uh, whatever you do, good, bad, otherwise is a result of what you have been through, what you have seen, what you've witnessed, what you've experienced. And when you see people that are ineffective or you see people winning, you know, winners find ways. Winners find ways to win and losers find ways to lose. When you see any human doing anything, you're seeing the byproduct of the atmospheric conditions. But what I've learned is that you can change your atmosphere. You can influence the atmospheres of others. Just like the weather, we all have our own. We can wake up every day and we can write a love story. We can write a tragedy. We can write a comedy. We can write a drama. We can, you know, pursue building a very successful business. We can pursue being a criminal and being a degenerate, right? There's all kinds of ways, and that has to do with the atmosphere conditions. And if your life is stormy, you got to get out of the storm. You, you Metaphorically speaking, get an umbrella, right? Uh, get a raincoat, you know, or maybe what you need is to get in the rain. Maybe you need to go have fun. Maybe you need to bring enthusiasm to it. So, uh, the atmospheric conditions, uh, have, you know, it doesn't make an excuse for people doing criminal behaviors and other people. I mean, I understand the whole concept of hurt people, hurt others, but there's a lot of people that are hurt that don't hurt other people. Uh, there's there's a, a lot of ways we can look at say, okay, you know, what is going on in my atmosphere that I need to step out of this? It kind of goes back to, you know, the best way to complete a project is to drop it. You know, some, some <laughs> things, you know. So, some people, everybody has a purpose in life, even if it's to serve as a bad example. And, you know, you, there's lessons, you're either winning or you're learning. There, there's all kinds of things that you can look at in life as you build and grow your business and grow your enterprise. And so much of someone's business success has everything to do with their life. You know, I mean, a lot of times people will come to Genius Network and they're looking for how do you become a bestseller? And we teach people how to do that. How do you get more clients? How do you convert better? You know, what are the before, during, and after units of your business? Are you good at lead conversion? What do you do once you have a lead? What do you do once you have a customer? After you've sold something, how do you deliver world-class service to these people so that it they'll keep buying from you in the orchestra? There's all these business stuff, but it's the human that, you know, if you're disconnected from yourself, it's really hard to be connected with other people. Like the, the, the punchline here on my book is it's a book on how to connect and meet people and, and and how to leverage relationships and how to align yourself with things. But the real key under it all, in in you know, I usually don't often say this, is it's 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 a book about connecting with yourself. You really want to connect with other people. You if all you if you're in pain in your own mind, in your own being, like to get Eckhart Tolle here, if you're in a pain body, it's really hard to be of service to other people. And if your current atmospheric conditions are really fucked up and they're they're really out of control, you gotta bring you gotta bring some calmness yeah. to that. I, I completely uh, agree. And yeah. and what I always say to to people, scaling starts from the inside out. Yeah. You know, it 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 ultimately it requires you to reflect on you, uh, to understand the atmospheric climate that you're currently operating within, and and seek to 
to you, the only way you can change that climate is actually by changing yourself. And so, yes. you know, I, I, everything you say, I'm, I'm so aligned. What I'm, what, what I'm uh, conscious of, I, what I, I'm going to make an appeal to people to go and get the book. But uh, for the context of, of this podcast and the time that we have, how do we, Joe, you know, the, 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 the short kind of masterclass, how do we magnetize those elf people to us? you know, that are easy, lucrative and fun and repel those who are hard, annoyingly and frustrating. How, you know, how do we discern from both given that, you know, time in this planet is our greatest currency and, you know, help the listeners kind of take away very practically where they're, they're currently maybe dealing with half type people there are, they're, they're tolerating half people within their network, but they don't have even have that language they're, they're They can't discern that they're half and they're continuing to waste time on this planet, actually trying to develop those relationships. So how can we magnetize the elf people and repel the half people? Yeah. Good, good question. And, and what I would say is for one, you have to be elf yourself if you want to attract other elf people, right? Uh, if you are a giver, you have to be a giver. If you want to attract givers, if you are surrounded by takers, you either uh, have, have not developed boundaries, which see, here's the challenge of being a giver. Uh, you know, cause it sounds good to say, be a giver, be a giver. I even wrote a book called Life Gives to the Giver. I give it away for free. Uh, people can get that at joesfreebook.com. I mean, it's one of my marketing things. And I actually give away, if someone doesn't want to buy my book, they can get the free book. Uh, however, uh, you know, what's in it for them uh, really goes through this uh, deeply. There's a chapter in the book, uh, be the type of person you would always answer the phone for. And what I mean by that is young people, I know a lot of young people and I try to encourage them to have real phone conversations and actually write real handwritten notes and put a stamp on them because it's becoming a lost art. Everything is yeah. like tech and no one talks to each other. And all. so I even tell, I have another chapter of be as in close to as person as possible. If you can't be with the person in person, do audio, do video, send messages so they hear the tone of voice so they can, you, you can't do that as easily with a, um, text message or with an email. And so much of social media is just a slice of some fabricated version of what they want to present themselves, but real conversations, real statements, real comments. So here's a test that I give people, and this will help them develop this, is uh, when I talk about be the type of person you know, I'd want to answer the phone for, for the next five or 10 people, after you've, you know, li they've, they've listened to both of us here in this podcasts whenever they stop listening or whenever it ends for them and they go out into the world and it could be night, it could be day, but the next five to 10 people that could co contact you or reach out to you, it could be someone you work with, someone that works for you. It could be friends. It could be family. It could be whoever. Do a gauge where look at the message that comes through if it's a text message or if it's a phone call or whatever and say, how do I, when I see that person's message come through or I get that call, do I want to immediately respond? Am I excited to receive that message? Or is there a part of me that's like gut feeling, ah, you know, like not more, am I woo or am I ah, you know, am I getting an ah feeling like shit, you know? And what I'll, what I have to also preface is that if you owe the person money, they're not the asshole. You're the asshole, maybe, right? So you got to take into consideration, are they calling you or reaching out to you because you are obligated with something you promised them or that you owe them? Or are they just someone you're excited to hear from? And why? And say, why do I, is this person elf or is this person half? Am I elf to them or am I half? You can even, most people may not have the courage to do this, but if you actually said to people, I would like your advice. You know, Robert Cialdini, who read my book and loves my book, he's the top influence guy in the world. Yeah. And I've known him for almost 30 years. A wonderful book. Oh, yes. Everyone should read the book Influence. It's it's great. Actually, I'll have him at Genius Network. Uh, he was here just two weeks ago, and I have him coming back in May. Oh, you want to hear? This is the cool shit I do, Genius. I just got to say this because I love it. So Chris Voss, who wrote Never Split the Difference. Yeah, we've had Chris on the show. Yeah, Chris is yeah, great. So Chris, Chris is a, he's a, he's a dear friend. He's a, he's a paying Genius Lovely Network. guy. So yeah, he's great. So he's going to co-host the uh, May Genius Network meeting with me. And uh, we're going to interview, I'm going to interview Chris, 
uh, Robert Cialdini and then B.J. Fogg, who is the oh, wow. uh, top uh, research professor who one of his students used his methodology and created Instagram. And he wrote a book called Tiny Habits. The top behavioral uh, uh, professor, the top influence guy in the world and the top negotiator guy in the world all together. And I'm I'm interviewing all three of them at once, which will be amazing. And then I've got my buddy Gino Wickman, who wrote Traction, yeah. coming in. I'm going to interview him at the same damn meeting. So that's the sort of stuff that I put together. But th the thing is, when it comes to influence, uh, you know, be the type of person you always want to answer the phone for. And who are you letting into your world and why? And are you excited about them? So for people to develop the skill of going out and getting elf relationships, you have to get rid of half relationships. Your, your not to-do list is more important than your to-do list. So I don't just apply elf to elf marketing and elf business strategies. I apply it to people. I apply it to projects. And so, you know, uh, when I'm overwhelmed, and th this will, this is going to sound completely out of left field, when I'm overwhelmed and I have too much stuff on my plate, uh, and this is one of the biggest dangers of entrepreneurship right now is there's so much information out there. Uh, what immediately brings relief to me when I'm overwhelmed is to add a new project to my plate. Now, why am I bringing this up? Because we get a dopamine hit from new things. We get a dopamine hit from novelty. And you have to be careful of the part of you that gets excited about certain people, but they're dangerous people. Like if you, uh, I know quite a bit about sexual addiction. If someone wants to learn about sex addiction, they can watch my interview with Pat Carnes, who's the top sex addiction doctor in the world on YouTube. I did that interview years ago. It's fascinating. But, you know, people get sexually charged over newness and novelty and someone that they consider hot. Well, that's what entrepreneurs do. Entrepreneurs are rarely uh, monogamous with ideas. They're very promiscuous. They're going to this group. They're reading this book. They're doing this business deal. And you got to be aware of that part of yourself as an entrepreneur, as a business owner saying, it looks good. It's going to taste really good like junk food or chocolate, but man, it's going to make me sick later because people are that way also. You have to know which people in your life are nourishment in which people are addiction, which yeah. people are elf, which people are half. And yeah. that's where the atmospheric conditions will really yeah. mess you up because people that have a lot of trauma, they find people whose dense match their dense. So oh. you have to you have to deal with like and not I shouldn't say deal, it's process. Yeah. You know, every every bad like what 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 like a, what comedy is in life, comedy is pain plus time equals comedy. You know, if you think of something where you got your heart ripped out of your chest, someone you really loved that left you and you felt just, it's so hurt and so, or, or you, you've you lost something that was really dear to you or you were embarrassed uh, about something or you can't believe you said the wrong thing, or you, you did something. For one, if you hurt other people, make amends. You want to scale your business? You're as sick as your secrets. Uh, silent battles are the hardest battles to fight. If you're if you're carrying around some thing where you've hurt somebody, if you can, I take this from twelve steps. You know, make amends whenever possible, except when to do so would injure yourself or others. Clean up your shit. You know, clean up your messes. Do therapy if you need to. Do a plant medicine journey in a very you know, don't be flippant yeah. about that. There's a lot of weirdos that are running yeah. around calling themselves shaman that are putting people in dangerous mm -hmm. things. You know, process this sort of stuff. But the thing is, if you want to get to elf, you got to get the halves away from you. I mean, there's a chapter even about uh, in the book where I write about, you know, Chris Voss, my buddy Chris Voss, high indicators of half, where there are certain things that people do that show you early on that they are going to be hard, annoying, lame, and frustrating. And you yeah. want to, and, and unlearning is uh, more important than learning. Yeah, so, this, is, this is something I want to get into just in closing because I'm conscious of time and oh my goodness, there's so much in this. Uh, Joe, you have, you, have, you have my head going in lots of different directions. The last hour has absolutely flown. You mentioned right at the end of your book that, the, you know, the... the taking your sabbatical. I want to come to that in a moment. Just, I'm going to, I'm going to put a bow on the, the elf and half, uh, in, in my coaching work, I always encourage my coaches to do uh, radiators and drains audit. 
And what I, for me, the radiators are those people within their network, within their life, who bring brilliant energy, who whenever you're, you know, you're excited to, to meet with them after you've met, the conversation is always positive. It's, it's productive. It's, it's forward thinking, it's growth oriented. Uh, and you come away just buzzing from from those conversations. The drains are where those are the people that use you as a receptacle just to vomit in and you're coming away. And each time you have a conversation, you're wondering why it takes you hours to come back round again to your normal atmospheric <laughs> climate. So uh, I right. love the, the elf and half. I'd never heard of that until I came across your work a number of years ago. And to say elf now is part of my my daily affirmation. But I want to come to to uh, just just before we formally close, you you had uh, the uh, a year's sabbatical in which you went and bought a, a town, which is just phenomenal. It's another podcast in itself. But I discovered that actually during the sabbatical, you discovered and you touched on it in the opening. Uh, the Wim Hof method. No, I discovered the Wim Hof method back in 2019. Absolutely changed my life. I found it so profound. I said, I need to become an instructor of this method. I went across to Amsterdam. I met with Wim. I did the fundamentals, went on, became a certified instructor. Now I coach within the business community. What has your journey with the Wim Hof method been like and how has it supported you in terms of your your addictions? And, and again, I would encourage people to pick up the book because you're really raw and honest and vulnerable in sharing all those those details in relation to your childhood and you know it's it's very oh it's so honest and it's so raw how has the wim hof method supported you in in your recovery joe well uh, so here i think it's more mental than even physical because you know wim uh of course has done the best job of popularizing you know cold plunging and breathing yeah, yeah, and, <laughs> absolutely. And then, of, of course <laughs> a, a great book is breath by james nestor yeah. who's uh, also a dear friend of mine and he's he's coming to my my event this year and i'm going to interview I, i've got an interview with with uh james online but um you know basically uh i started doing cold plunging and i hated the cold yeah. but it wasn't until i listened to the wim hof method book uh you know Brilliant. the audio version which is not you know you know it, you know Wim, Wim is yeah. nutty as hell right <laughs> but he uh i mean just but what he discovered before when everyone thought he was nuts yeah. And he is nuts, but they've actually proven through science that he's actually really, you know, he was really on to something that's been proven. So uh, what 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 it has done is there's probably nothing in the last 10 years that I've done physically that has made me feel mentally better than doing cold plunging and saunas uh, and, and, of course, the breathing that goes along with it. Right. So the, the what, but here's what i learned so i've become friends uh you know over the last few months with dr anna lemke who wrote uh dopamine nation she's a stanford professor i'm actually she's coming to my event this year wow. too and so she um uh, if you eat chocolate you'll get a 55 percent dopamine hit sex is a 150 percent dopamine hit cocaine is a 225 percent dopamine hit amphetamines are a thousand percent dopamine hit uh Cold plunges, as an example, is a 200% dopamine hit. You get more of a dopamine hit from doing a cold plunge or a cold shower than you do from sex. So if you want to know what does it, I mean, that's one reason alone, right? So it makes you feel good. And it, it's it, it's good for your body, and it, it it's a lot of woo in the be, uh, like a lot of ah in the beginning, yeah. but you become cold adapted, and you become heat adapted, and like I'll tell you. If you can, if you do a cold shower or you do a breathing thing, the rest of the day just has a sense of yeah. ease. Does, does, it's, you know, it's not a magic cure for, uh, although it could be though. I mean, I, you know, I, I shouldn't say it's not a magic cure. I mean, what is a magic cure? Mm -hmm. If something makes you feel magical, if something uh, resolves something, I mean, there's a lot of people that have, have gone through that process and do it consistently. But consistency, as with anything, yeah. is the key. You don't eat a meal once and then all of a sudden a healthy meal and you're healthy or work out once and all. I mean, it is a consistent thing. And, and I'll tell you, like I have introduced so many people 
to uh, to cold plunging. Uh, I mean, I can, I've now sat in a 37 degrees, uh, you know, plunge up to my neck for 13 minutes. Now, Wim, of course, I think his world record is what, like packed in ice for an hour and 48 minutes. Yeah, yeah almost a couple crazy. of hours. That's right. Yeah. 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 And, uh, but I'll tell you, like when, when he was in a situation where his wife had, had killed, yeah. had committed suicide and oh, he was yeah. left with four kids and he had no money and he had all this trauma and he had, he had this, he had to be a responsible father as best as he could. You know, he, the, the story of how the cold healed him really was the thing that got me to be like, you know, I really need to look into this and I need to do it. So I started doing it. And towards the end of my sabbatical, I took a one year sabbatical because I knew the world was going into a very dark place. And I wanted to, uh, I'll probably end this. I'll share with you the million dollar racehorse thing and, and the cold plan. I'll just share it right now. So if you had, and I write about this in my book, if you had a racehorse and every time the horse ran a race, you'd win a million dollars. Then the question is, how do you take care of that horse? You would give it the best food, the best nutrition. You'd have the best trainers. Uh, you would uh, not have the horse up at 3 a.m. snorting cocaine, drinking alcohol, watching porn, smoking cigarettes. You wouldn't be shoving fast food down its throat. You would take care of that horse. Uh, you would not have the horse overworked. You would have the horse in the right races, not the wrong races. You wouldn't have the horse hanging around with losers. You'd have the horse hanging around with winners. Because if you take care of that horse, the horse wins races, you you get rich. So I always say to the entrepreneur, what's the difference with you? How are you treating your racehorse? Are you the million dollar racehorse? Who are you hanging out with? What information are you putting into your brain? What food are you putting into your body? What are your health rituals? Because the issues are in the tissues. And uh, cold plunging and breathing and saunas and exercise, you know, the opposite of addiction is connection and the ultimate form of connection is flow. So as, in, so as much as we can get to that state of flow, all the better. And so that's why I think, you know, cold therapy and breathing and people that are like, I hate it, I hate it. You only hate it because you haven't adopted your brain uh, to, to realize it's not a physical thing. It's mostly a mental. There are some physical conditions. They're very rare, but there are some people where cold is not, they're not able to do it. It's not good for them sort of thing. So none of this is medical advice. Obviously check with your doctor, blah, 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 but make sure you have a, a smart doctor. Cause there's a lot of dipshit doctors in the world too. Uh, you know, what do they call the guy that, uh, got the lowest in his class, but graduated from uh, medical school in Harvard, they call him doctor. You know, so you can, you know, there's a lot of amazing doctors and there's, but I'll tell you, like when I look back over the last three years of the, the pandemic and everything, uh, there's a lot of doctors that don't follow the uh, Hippocratic Oath anymore, you know, where do no harm because there's a lot of people. That's a whole nother podcast, but I'm sorry I went on a tangent there. No, but, uh, not at all. <laughs> and um, you have brought me to, to our close uh, and you've already shared so many wonderful takeaways in look, it's this hour has felt like five hours. You've, you've been an absolute elf guest. You certainly walk your talk, Joe. It's, it's brilliant. Uh, can you provide our listeners with three timeless takeaways, given the rich, colorful, probably 20 lives that you've already lived in, in one life and you're still living it. <laughs> Yeah. Um, let me think here. Um, you know, I think the million dollar racehorse is a good one. I've talked about that, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, in order to connect with other people, you have to connect with yourself. I mean, I, I, I have to remind myself that every day, where am I disconnected? If I'm having a bad day, uh, feelings are not facts just because you feel shitty doesn't mean things are shitty. Yeah. Just because you feel great. Doesn't mean things are great. You have to connect with uh, the results. Be a result leader, not a thought leader. Any idiot could come up with a thought. Uh, I admire people that actually have the ability to produce a result. So if you're going to scale your business and you're going to go out into the world, be a result leader. R find people that produce results. Uh, you know, there's a lot of people that are like confetti. You know, they uh, they they sound really good, but uh, you know, you realize it's like cotton candy. There's nothing there. You know. So, and then the most expensive information in the world is bad information. 
so be careful what you consume and what you uh, believe, because a belief means you're just not sure. Uh, oftentimes we are, uh, the challenge with being human is most humans, myself included, uh, we always think we're right. And oftentimes we are very wrong. And we may be right from one perspective, but, you know, I write about this in the book. It originally is a line, I think Stephen Covey, uh, you know, as people judge themselves by their intentions, they judge others by their actions. So just because you have good intentions does not necessarily mean your actions are producing value and a good result for other people. So take a look at your actions, not your intentions. Uh, and when you are wrong, uh, step back, pause, and you know, I was way more reactive uh, when I was younger. And when I was in active addiction, I was reacting to life. When my life is not working, I'm reacting to life. When my life is working, uh, I respond. And, and responding is this responding with ability. It's being responsible. So uh, courage doesn't feel good. Confidence feels good. But in order to, to have confidence, you actually have to operate with courage, especially when you don't know what you're doing. So uh, like Dan Sullivan says, you know, the difference between fear and courage is uh, fear is peeing your pants. Courage is doing what you need to do with wet pants. So <laughs> we, you know, we, we have to, you know, we have to operate with courage. And so for the listeners, uh, you know, and, and, and Brendan, it's, it's, it's really great to, to, to have this conversation with you. I hope it impacts people. People can buy my book or they don't have to buy my book. If they want to change their life in a lot of ways, it's a cheap book. It can definitely do that. I didn't write the book. So that it's, uh, you know, I wrote this book. So when I'm dead, hopefully my book will still be around and benefit people. I spent two years. Uh, I, I read the book myself. If people prefer listening to audio so they can listen to the audio version, the website is what's in it for them. They can get it there. And if they don't buy my book, that's OK, too. Just operate in the world with the attitude of what's in it for them. And I think you'll 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 go further that way. And if anyone, since I talked about it, if anyone's struggling with addiction, I have a uh, I have a, a foundation. It's Genius Recovery. We don't we don't charge for anything. It's free. It's an educational platform. It's GeniusRecovery.org. So if anyone needs direction, uh, you know it, it it doesn't offer treatment. I mean, in the future, would we? I don't know. Right now, it's purely education videos, links to. You know, we have a blog that's written by one of the world's greatest therapists, Ken Wells, that comes out twice a week. And, uh, you know, if if anyone's struggling with addiction or has friends or family members and you don't understand it, it's there for that. But I think, you know, a lot of people, if they want to scale, deal with their addictions. D don't become a workaholic. Workaholism is a respectable addiction. And, you know, simple scaling, if you just take those two words, don't make it difficult scaling. Don't make it half scaling. You know, keep it simple. You know, oftentimes innovation is fetish, fetishized. You know, you, there's a lot of things you don't need to innovate. Like a lot of people get all gaga and they celebrate innovation as if it's this like big thing. Like, you know, it's that whole saying, you know, the space pen supposedly cost NASA $10 million. It's an urban myth, but they had this story where, you know, they spent $10 million to make a pen, a pen that would, uh, you know, write in space, but the Russians didn't have 10 million. So they just used a pencil. So, you know. <laughs> <laughs> keep shit simple you don't need to make it complicated uh, be a good, he, be a good he, human he, he, being he, he. and life will go far if you do oh uh, here here uh, those those takeaways have been so profound i want to acknowledge you joe for the the selfless work you do especially within your addiction recovery um uh, organization and and all of the information you put out there I've been following you for quite some time. You know, you're always acknowledging the work of Dan Sullivan from Strategic Coach. Uh, you know, you reference Dan's wonderful book. It's a book that we actually share in our program, Who Not How, brilliant book. Also, your friend Peter Diamandis, Abundance 360. Again, I mean, it's 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 wonderful to watch, uh, you know, from afar what you guys are doing together, how you endorse one another, how you're part of each other's networks and, um, and you know, the, what you're putting out there is, is, is selfless and of huge, huge value. So for people who are not aware of, of, and uh, they've heard, you know, they're hearing of you for the first time, I'd be very surprised if that was the case, Joe, but, uh, we're best to connect with you. Well, you know, I think if people want to get, I have a uh, Joe Polish is my Twitter. It's my website. It is Instagram. I'm not a big social media guy, even though my team puts stuff out there. 
I don't pretend like I don't respond to most messages on social media because I don't like having people acting like they're me and responding on my behalf. So we don't do that. And if anyone ever does, it'll say it's a team member because I don't, you know, I'm very much about don't pretend someone you're not. I wrote my book myself. AI didn't do it, uh, even though we're very involved in a lot of AI training. I do have an AI newsletter. Someone wants to see it. It's connectioninsider.ai, where we have a newsletter that curates my very best topics and stuff, which people love that. But that's connectioninsider.ai. And uh, joesfreebook.com. That's that's the best uh, place to, if you want to get on uh you know, see my musings and I don't give away a, a a free book and then hammer people into an upsell funnel. I actually just give away a really good book. And if people like my emails, they like my emails. That's, that's sort of Brilliant. the thing. And I, I play the long game. I play the long game. I'm not, even though I love marketing, I really think give value to people first before you ever expect them to give you money. And, uh, Brilliant. well, what's yeah. next for you in the long game? Well, we have the town of Cleeter, Arizona, you know, the ghost town I bought. Yeah. Uh, so right now we're, we just had a group of artists there about uh, three weeks ago. We had our first art event. We're going to use that for artists for addicts, which is something I created using art as a force for good and just, uh, you know, keep running Genius Network. You know, Genius, I, I didn't answer this earlier, but Genius Network, I started doing coaching in 1998 with my clients and I found that my favorite ways of learning was bringing humans together. And now with AI and we are more connected digitally be, ever before in human history, but we're more disconnected as humans. So everything that I try to do is about connection, bringing people together with themselves and with others. And, you know, Genius Network started out as a mastermind. It's not a mastermind anymore. We do masterminding there, but it's a connection network. So my whole thing is to build connection networks and to scale connection. And so that's that's what I attempt to do. And uh, that's why I have my book. And then, you know, my movie, We someone made a movie on my life called... Uh, you know, the connected the Joe Polish story. And so that's out there and people love it. And uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's just cool stuff. So well, we're going to get, get links to a lot, a lot of that. So if the show notes are going to be quite extensive this time around, <laughs> Joe, look, I've been wanting to get you on for, for so long now. It's been an absolute privilege. It really has to, to host you on the show today. You've delivered Thank so you. much value. Uh, Joe, take care. Thank you, sir. Have a great day.